Hey, everyone. It's Russ, and welcome to this episode of Women's Retirement Radio. I'm really excited uh, today to be joined by Barb Sidoric of uh, Lasting Matters. Barb, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for inviting me to speak with you. Yeah, I'm glad you could join us. So uh, why don't you start by, uh, I know you and I have known each other for a a few years now, uh, although it's been a while since we've spoken. Um, Why don't you tell us a little bit about who you are uh, personally, and then we can kind of dive into what you're working on these days. Uh, So on a personal level, um, I'm a boomer. Um, I'm a wife, a mother, a grandmother of two uh, adorable granddaughters. Uh, I went, I graduated from Connecticut College back in the late 70s and um, went on to the Institute for Paralegal Training and secured my uh, first job and started my career as a state trust paralegal at a large law firm in Boston. Um, I come from three generations of financial advisors. My great grandfather started his own firm. Uh, my grandfather was a partner. My father was an advisor until he retired at 83. And I am also married to Tom Sidoric, who is a nationally recognized fiduciary at the Sidoric Group. So um, being organized and talking about sort of all the what ifs in life um, seem to be part of my DNA and my family upbringing. Um, I founded uh, Lasting Matters in 2014 as sort of a combination of my training as an estates and trust paralegal, but also the ex- personal experience of my mother's death, which is actually uh, today, 15 years ago. Wow. Well, I guess this is uh, maybe timely for this conversation. And I am eager to dig into your work with Lasting Matters, but um, something that really jumped out at me are the two uh, granddaughters. So how old are they? So they are two and a half and seven months. So they were born almost exactly two years apart. Uh, One is our, we call her our COVID therapy baby because she's (laughs) adorable. And uh, anyway, been part of our pod and it's very exciting to be uh, a grandparent. I can can only imagine, but I I especially imagine it's been uh, something you're thankful for with all the COVID stuff uh, going on here the last uh, year plus. Yes, and fortunately they live uh, about 20 minutes away. So they've been part of our bubble and um, it's been uh, it's been great up for both them and for us. Perfect. Um, I know you shared a, a, a good bit with us there a moment ago, Barb, but what's something interesting about you that most people would not know? So I'm a lifelong learner. But I also like, and I guess I should say, I also like to learn things that are challenging to me or something that I might be uncomfortable doing. Um, So in the past, um, I learned how to navigate the waters and learn boats, how to boat, boat safely. Um, I learned how to shoot a gun. Uh, That was sort of a frightening education, but um, interesting nonetheless. But I think... The most interesting thing is that seven years ago, um, my husband uh, decided that he wanted to try uh, transcendental meditation. And I sort of poo-pooed the whole thing. Uh, Yet we went to, uh, we went to training and we got taught and we've now meditated twice a day for 20 minutes for the last seven or eight years. And honestly, I have to say that besides lowering uh, blood pressure and creating calm in our lives. Um, it really is amazing about how it changes your clarity in decision-making where we would be waffling before it sort of, uh, it clears your mind and, um, allows you to make decisions, uh, more clear, clearly, I guess. Could, could you speak to that just a, a little bit more? Does it help you uh, make uh, individ- uh, decisions individually more clearly uh, and have more clarity? Or does it help as a couple reaching decisions as well? I would say both. Um, whereby I might have waffled, sat on a fence about something or other that, you know, I think um, I tend to be more the warrior in the family. Uh, so it, it allowed me to sort of see the pros and cons on both sides and then make a decision faster as an individual, but also the the two of us are able to uh, 
compromise uh, and come to decisions uh, together, uh, I guess, uh, with more ease. Um, and also, did we always learn to defer whoever it's more important to? Um, that's where we go in our marriage. So, yeah. Well, that's fantastic. Thanks for sharing that. Um, yeah. So, uh, I know you mentioned uh, your two granddaughters are not quite five years old yet, but let's say uh, let's say a five year old came up to you and says, uh, "said Barb, tell me about what it is that you do." How would you explain your work to a five year old? So, I guess I would tell a five year old that. At, um, I would ask them first if they like to read and if they like books. And I would tell them that I wrote a book that um, you can actually write in and that the book was filled with um, lots of questions and lots of places for people to write down their answers. And I created the book in order to help people like their parents um, to write down important information that will be useful to somebody else in the family member when they may not be around to answer those questions or tell them where to find things. Interesting. So um, before we jump a little bit more into details, how long have you been, uh, how long have you been working on Last of Matters? Uh, well, pretty much after the sudden death of the experience of my mother's sudden death, um, I really at that time uh, said to my my father that I did not want to have the same experience when he died. Uh, he'll be 90 the end of the month, by the way. Wow. And he, uh, I started asking him all kinds of questions. I wanted to know what he had and where it was located and what were his wishes, et cetera. Um, and th that sort of catapulted me into using my organizational skills and my training as a states and trust paralegal to put together, it's, I spent four years interviewing people, t hearing their stories about all the things that went wrong after somebody died and really boiling down the nuts and bolts of anybody's life and all the details that are missing from most um, planning, financial planning and estate planning uh, that end up being really important at when somebody dies um, and having to track that down. So. Uh, um, I would say that probably 2006 was the start of thinking about what I could do to help others. Um, and then I launched uh, Lasting Matters in 2014. It was very hard from the beginning really to, to define, uh, well, I wanted to make planning for death or incapacity something that wasn't morbid or morose. It's something that was actually more um, instructional and easygoing and um, you know, just not make it a scary thing. So that took, that took time to do and, and create a, a, I guess, a brand that is more, um, the importance of what this information, uh, is about when somebody dies. And clearly no one likes to think about much less to talk about death or, uh, mortality. Uh, but have you found that in your work, uh, in conversations with people that, your approach and using uh, Lasting Matters has made it a little bit uh, less um, taboo or a little less intimidating, uh, something a little bit more uh, accessible or approachable by, by people that really kind of understand the intent? Yes, it has uh, actually opened a lot of eyes. <laughs> um, first of all, you're right. Most people don't want to talk about uh, their death. Um, and I try to use the word death. Uh, you know, a lot of times people say, oh, you know, we lost Uncle Joe. Well, we didn't lose him, he, he died. Um, so uh, clarity and uh, communicating and, and also um, having, you know, I want people to have meaningful conversations with their spouse, their partner, their family members to talk about topics that maybe in the past they wanted to cover their ears or deny the inevitability of death. Um, so creating sort of a guide and resource allows people to use it um, in conversations, as well as if they really don't want to have a conversation to me, the most important thing is that you take the time to write things down, because it's really the gathering of the information that ultimately is what um, those left behind will need. 
Um, but yes, it has become, um, it allows, you know, different generations um, to hand a copy of the um, organizer to their parents and say, look, you know, I, I really would like to have this information uh, when something happens to you. Um, could you please do that for me? Most, most parents would like to help their children or adult children um, get organized. I also understand that a lot of spouses don't talk to each other about sort of all the nuts and bolts of, of their lives. And this is, and if you ask any widow, uh, you widow in particular, because women generally outlive men, um, they're often lo lost um, and they have no idea where to begin. Um, so it becomes a resource and guide um, before that, that tragedy happens. And you're just, you want to just grieve instead of having to try to find the passwords to your computer, et cetera. Yeah. I think you've, I think you maybe have already addressed this, but I don't want to put words in your mouth. So in, in your, from your perspective, Barb, what would you say is most unique about both the person you are and the people you serve through Lasting Matters and, and how you serve them? What is unique about me? I, well, I, I probably the combination of being trained as an estates and trust paralegal, um, you know, my job, I was, I was often sent to widows homes, um, widow or widower, um, to look for uh, information for the court inventory. And what I, what I experienced was uh, chaos, uh, decisions not having been made, family members fighting about possessions, not knowing whether mom wanted to be cremated or buried. And uh, all of that uh, experience um, stuck, stood with me for decades. And then when I, my mother died and I found myself in the middle of that same situation. Now, certainly we had estate planning documents and all that, but we'd never had conversations with her about what her wishes would, would be for a funeral and what would happen to her, you know, possessions, et cetera. So I think that I'm unique in the combination of those two things. Plus I happen to be somebody who is organized and likes to be organized. So I thought that those combinations would help other adults who may not have the skill to know where or how to begin either having conversations or actually gathering what information will be important um, after their uh, spouse dies. Um, that, that that sort of is unique to me. Now, who I serve, um, you know, I serve any adult um, because we don't, we don't know when we're going to die. Um, some people have lots of things and assets when they're younger, maybe even in their 20s. And But uh, I honestly think people should really start when they create their first will or they get married or have a child or all of these milestones um, is the time to really think about what do you have and what happens um, if you weren't here to answer all their questions. So it's just, I really wanted to help other people uh, navigate what happens after somebody dies uh, in a much easier way than what I saw and experienced as a paralegal and what I experienced also with my, my mother's own uh, sudden death. And I'm, I'm just curious, do you think your husband uh, serving as a financial advisor and then your family going back to your great-grandfather being in the financial services industry and serving as financial advisors. I mean, clearly your, your mom's death was the real catalyst here, but has your, um, has your um, relation to the financial advice industry also impacted or um, weighed into the work you're doing? Very much so. Um, you know, because I grew up in a family that always made plans. Um, and uh, also we talked about the what ifs in life. Uh, what happens if this happens and what would we do if this? And I think that um, uh, fiduciaries, financial 
financial advisors uh, can be a very central uh, role in helping uh, clients navigate all these things. And, and I, I, I honestly sort of believe in a trifecta of the estate attorney and accountant and a fiduciary working together for the sake of their client because um, they all have they all have different pieces of it. Um, my work with Lasting Matters really was sort of the missing piece, which to me was all the details that aren't um, discussed or laid out um, that are so personal that only you know in your head. Um, and so I wanted a way to be able to communicate that. But I definitely think that my we, we continue in our household to plan, make plans, change plans, think about our legacy, um, especially as boomers. Um, and I'm t and I have three adult children. Um, and I have, uh, you know, my father's 90. So we have, we continue to have ongoing conversations with him even about what his wishes are. Um, so it's a, it's, it's a lifelong discussion. Um, and I think that uh, the more people have the conversations, uh, you know, with, with clear decisions being made, the better off, uh, first of all, they'll feel it's a, I think it's a huge gift to, to your clients or to yourself uh, to get your affairs in order. And it's an enormous gift to those when something happens. You've used a, a term a couple of times, fiduciary. Um, you and I both know what that means, but for our listeners, could you take just a quick second and, and explain what you mean when you say fiduciary? Well, when I mean fiduciary, I mean somebody, uh, a uh, advisor, financial advisor, who uh, puts the interests of the client first above everything else. Um, they're not trying to sell you products. They're not trying to coerce you into, you know, um, buying things that you either do or think you need or don't need. They're more um, of, I, I would say, uh, protective and um, their relationship is more important to the client because they aren't driven by selling. Got it. In a way. That's all, yeah, that's awful. Thank you. So um, why don't you share with us a, a favorite Lasting Matters success story? Um, just over the years that you've been doing this work and talking with people, um, you, you've already shared a lot of the benefits, but why don't you maybe share a specific story that you uh, is particularly memorable for you? Sure. Um, so a very close friend of my husband's uh, retired and uh, happily went off to bike into the sunset. Uh, and then sadly uh, was uh, given a diagnosis of uh, terminal cancer. And, uh, you know, this is right at the time that I was, uh, I, had, I think I just published the organizer and I sent um, him and his wife a copy uh, because I knew that they would need it. I, you know, whether they asked for it or not, it, to me, it was my gift to them to help them, you know, in the short term, um, get as much information um, collected in one place as they could. So he went about and he filled out the organizer. And after his death, his mother his mother had come to his wife and said, you know, I really want a, him to celebrate his life with a huge Catholic funeral mass. Um, and his wife was actually able to share uh, to, with her that his wishes in his own handwriting were that he didn't want to have that, that he wanted to have his friends sort of celebrate his life with small cocktail parties and to toast his life and to not have a typical uh, Catholic funeral. So with that, um, his wife was able to share his written words with her mother-in-law 
and was able to diffuse any family tensions that were going to probably erupt around what the funeral should be or shouldn't be. Um, and they ended up honoring his wishes and she, which could have been a huge divide at an emotionally charged time. And I remember her getting in touch with me saying, thank you so much. Cause I was able to, I was able to honor what he wanted and not get into sort of a big thing with uh, her mother-in-law. So that, that's sort of by the, the success story um, that comes to mind. But I, you know, I had two other friends who both had terminal cancer, sadly, and they each planned their entire funerals. I mean, down to, you know, whether there were Snickers bars in a in a bowl or um, what music was playing, et cetera. And having attended both of those funerals, um, it was pretty amazing because everybody felt that it was very personal and that uh, it was like uh, our friends were hosting their own celebratory party that had uh, so many personal touches um, that were meaningful versus, uh, as I tell people, you know, planning a funeral, you only get it usually a few days. Uh, it's all the same components as planning a wedding, but with weddings, you have a year to plan. Um, so, you know, having, having them sort of pre-plan their own services and music and flowers and who was going to be invited, et cetera, uh, made it very special and um, made us all smile as, you know, as we walked out the door, say, wow, that was really all about our friend. And I, I can't, based on that first story, I can't help but think that the issue of, about the mom's wishes and her son's wishes, um, you know, not having that written in his own handwriting to kind of diffuse that situation, thankfully. I mean, that that's something that, that I can imagine could have easily driven a wedge between the mom and the surviving daughter-in-law for years or for the rest of their lives. I mean- Absolutely, yeah. Wow. It also, that also happens uh, believe, a lot in blended families. Oh yeah, when, I can imagine so when there's, yeah. yeah. There's, if there's not been a clarity in what um, what the decedent really wanted. Uh, there can be a lot of uh, animosity and uh, and wedges that 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 are lifelong problems. Yeah. Sad. Yeah. Yeah. It really is. But you can avoid that. Uh, and, you know, I just say people. You know, think about what you would like and write it down so that nobody has to guess. Right. Right. What. What would you say has surprised you most about your work to date around end of life planning, lasting matters, these kind of documenting people's wishes and um, how they would like things to kind of be left, uh, left behind? What's been most surprising to you? Um, well, I guess the first thing I was mostly surprised about were all the stories I heard about all the things that went wrong after somebody died. And everybody, when asked, wanted to share that story. Um, and I heard hundreds of stories, you know, people, people putting safes in their houses with all their stuff and the other spouse not knowing the combination. So how do you, you know, how do you extract or get, you know, a safe cracked? Um, all kinds of things. But I think that I think what surprised me the most is that I'm, I've, I'm always at ease talking to others about the benefits of planning ahead for incapacity and death. But the more conversations that I have with others, um, I, I, I feel that they are more at ease in actually um, going ahead and discussing difficult topics with somebody. Um, so I, I'm, I'm surprised, um, but happy that they are, that they're sort of starting to, th there's more, um, there's more talk about death and dying. I, on, and, you know, if you think about COVID-19, um, I, I think that this pandemic has illuminated 
the need for having these conversations sooner rather than later and making plans because you just don't know. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we really don't. Um, what's a, what's a thinking about the work you do? And I know you have training as a trust in the state's paralegal and things like that, but what's a, what's a common misconception around the work you do? I mean, I, I can imagine people saying, well, you know, I, I, I did that in my will and things like that. Um, I'm not sure if that ever comes up, but what is a, what's maybe a common misconception about the work you do versus the actual value and benefit that it, that, that it delivers? Well, I would say, uh, first of all, the, there's a misconception that my work only pertains to old people, <laughs> old in quotes. Yeah. Um, young people die too. And young people have wishes. Uh, they also may have certain um, ideas of what they want to have happen to their possessions after they die. And it never, it never really occurs to younger people that they need to take um, some kind of action now, whether that's um, in, in creating your first will when you get married or, um, you know, having uh, healthcare proxies, uh, if you need a power of attorney, et cetera. You know, it's sort of the all, there's, the, there's three pieces. There's sort of the documents that are needed. Um, and then there's the decisions that have to be made and, you know, um, getting a decision, making a decision to get married is just the start of combining lives and ideas and, and decisions that you'll make together. And, you know, so these are things that you need to talk about. Um, and then there's, you know, I'm, I'm all about the details. Um, so I would say the biggest, <laughs> the most common misconception is that we're, t I'm talking about people that are in their eighties and nineties and I'm not, I'm, I'm talking about all living adults. Um, can everybody has something in their head that nobody else knows uh, yeah. that, that somebody will need or want if something were too tragic to happen to them. Um, certainly if you have a, you know, if you have a time um, and somebody has a terminal cancer or you or Alzheimer's, the beginning of Alzheimer's is very important to get all that information before you, you can't, you, there's no longer a, a place to have somebody answer your questions. So. And maybe, uh, maybe a, a kind of a, a, a different way of, of asking the, the same question and less of a misconception, but what would you say most often prevents people from doing this important work or having these important conversations, whether that's, whether that's, you know, through a, a tool like lasting matters or just in general, I mean, what, why don't more people do this? And I, and I know we maybe touched on some of it earlier that folks yeah. just don't like to address mortality, but, but from your perspective, what do you, what do you think that is? Well, I think what prevents them from, um, uh, honestly, the number one is that they're afraid to talk about death or to confront their own mortality. Um, they don't think it's gonna happen to them. So they kick the can down the road um, or they may not have yet experienced the loss of somebody close to them. And therefore they don't, they don't really understand the myriad of tasks that follow someone's death. Uh, in order to wrap up somebody's life. If you ask anybody who, you know, is <laughs> sort of named an executor, um, people think that that's, you know, an honored position, but it is a huge job to be an executor when somebody dies. Um, and so I, you know, I think that if you, if you ask any widow, they get it because most of them say, oh, I wish I knew, I wish I, I wish I had had a guide or resource to, to help to have all this information because my husband left me with nothing. Um, and it takes them a long time to um, unwind, uh, unwind all the, the pieces and the scavenger hunt that happens. But um, I think that, you know, people are just sort of afraid of, 
of dealing with it. And they think, oh, you know, this won't happen to me. I'll, you know, put this off for several more years. I mean, how many times have you heard, even recently, uh, we always hear about sort of celebrities that don't have wills. They die intestate. And it's like, what? Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, and, and then it leaves a mess. Yeah. And you read about the mess. <laughs> well, and to be clear, you just, you mentioned like a lot of widows, um, like find themselves and, and they've been left with nothing. Yeah. But to be clear, um, being left with nothing does not mean no assets, no money. Oh, I don't uh, need it that. It just either. means no instructions, no yeah, details, yeah. not no, 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 uh, no kind of paint by numbers, like do this, do this, do this. Correct. Right. right. Correct. No, they're not left with nothing. They're left, they're, they're left with sometimes lots uh, right. But I don't know what to do with it. I mean, especially right. if there's a business, let's say their spouse has a business or in particular, if they haven't handled their own, haven't been part of um, sort of household expenses and who takes care of all that, uh, you know, they, they're, they're often in the dark um, and, um, and that creates more anxiety um, than anything. It's like, what do I do now? And that, and, and actually that's where I think, uh, you know, the role of a fiduciary is, is key. And I think too, as you just mentioned, like we, we've all heard and read about the celebrities uh, dying without, without a will in place. Um, and whether it's a celebrity um, that's, you know, uh, well-known or a neighbor two doors down, the will is kind of the, uh, for, for lack of a better term, it's kind of the legal instructions for here's what happens when I'm not around. Um, and I, I think of, and, and correct me if I'm, uh, if I'm not doing this justice, but I, I think of Lasting Matters as almost the more practical um, guide or practical directions beyond just the legal that says, Here's where things are. Here's um, here's who to call about this. Here's what I would love to see, um, you know, happen um, with my services or things like that. Is that is that a fair characterization? Yes. Um, and honestly, sort of lasting matters when when you go through when you go through sort of the legal documents. I'm I was more interested in do you have one and where is it. And who's the, who's the lawyer? Who's your state attorney? Um, I, you know, there's no legal advice given with lasting matters, but it is more of the details of all the other things. Your, you know, your personal details, your real estate, um, you know, your your biographical data for writing an obituary, um, all those other things. So uh, documents are a part of the holistic planning, I think uh, that each adult should have, uh, but that's only a piece of it. And lasting matters, I'm really, I was only interested in, do you have one? And actually it, it, when people go through the organizer, they say, hey, well, what's that? Maybe, maybe I need to do that. Or I haven't updated my estate plan in a while. I should, I should review that. So it's, it's a reminder because it's so detailed um, of all the things that maybe you haven't done or haven't visited in, uh, in a while. Um, and all of those my milestones such as retirement are, are times to really, um, I think, take a huge holistic view of your life and your death uh, as you plan. Yeah, well, I, and I'm, I'm glad you brought up a retirement because I want to revisit that in, in just a moment. Um, but first, if um, I mean you're you're a entrepreneur, you you created and, and run a business. It happens to be Lasting Matters, and it deals with these topics we've been talking about. But but if a let's say a student in college approached you and said said Barb, I'm I'm interested in in the work you're doing, um, and that could be uh, you know kind of directly related to what you do, or or maybe it's more in the traditional estate planning field or something like that. Um, what advice or guidance would you give someone that was, you know, maybe in their, you know, late teens, going into their twenties, that said, "I'm interested in doing in, in in the work you do and learning more about how you do it." So I actually uh, at college was uh, a child development major. Really, um, and uh, I made a decision that I 
didn't really want to teach. And, and I was always interested maybe because of my uh, family being so immersed in um, the, you know, the whole financial world. Um, I thought that it would be really interesting to learn about um, whether, whether I wanted to go to law school or not. So I decided, well, I'll, I'm going to go to paralegal school. And so I can sort of dip my toes in the water. And I was sort of taken more with um, estates and trust work Number one, I really enjoyed math. So uh, I was interested in, in tax prep, et cetera. But more than that, I learned that uh, estates and trust work is not just about preparing documents, although that is a, a large piece of it. It's about families and relationships within families and creating, creating um, documents that may, you know, survive for generations as, um, you know, family wealth uh, gets uh, passed around or legacy planning and charitable giving, et cetera. Um, so I, I, what I loved about learning about that is, and, and then ultimately being a paralegal was that lives, you know, are very complicated and complex. And, but I really enjoyed working with the families to help them um, to, were, during a very difficult time of their life and to um, uh, also do sort of the pre-planning in terms of um, conversations um, to create a will or a trust or something that um, would you know, embrace what their wishes were. Um, so I, I would tell college students also that you know, boomers, we are a graying tsunami. Uh, um, if you, I was looking demographics, demographics speak to what, what's happening in the world um, and that there's a lot of opportunity to work with or for the older population. And we're living a lot longer. I mean, years ago, you know, at my age was, you know, you were done, you know, um, now, you know, people are living nineties and hundreds, et cetera. So people are living longer and there's, um, so there's plenty of, there's plenty more time to help them, uh, plan and, um, navigate the changing, uh, dynamics of, let's say even the state planning. If you look at what's happening now, um, with um, the president, uh, Biden, talking about uh, changes in estate tax laws, uh, lifetime gift exemptions, et cetera. Um, they're in capital gains and stepped up basis. There's all kinds of things that are always happening. And you have to, if you enjoy that kind of work and helping families um, with their legacies and um, in tax plan, et cetera, then this is, this is the place for you. Yeah. I guess, yeah, I guess, uh, I guess there, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of job security, uh, lo yeah. longevity and jo job security around, around those fields. Yes. <laughs> well, thanks for sharing that. Um, back to retirement, since you, you, you mentioned it just a moment ago, when, when you think of the word retirement personally, what, what, what comes to mind for you? Well, I guess, uh, I would say that it, 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 the word actually means to me sort of the end of work in a conventional way. In other words, you're getting paid to do something and that something is, you know, what, whatever your career is. And it's the, it, it marks the end of something in a conventional way. But I also think of it as sort of, it becomes a, a freedom with uh, sort of boundless opportunities to maybe do the things that you didn't have time to do when you quote worked. Uh, and, and that is sort of uh, what, is, what, is the, what is the next step? So it's, it's, it's both. It means the end of something uh, conventional in work space, but then it sort of opens up, I mean, you may, you know, volunteer to, to do whatever. Um, 
in your retirement, or you may want to golf or, or read a million books or what, whatever it is that you want to do. Um, I, I'd look at it as sort of a passage of, of a change of how your days are structured, maybe. Yeah. So would it, would it be fair to describe, describe your perspective as it's a, it's a transition, mm -hmm. um, but you're, you're, you're the one that gets to define what you're transitioning into maybe, maybe out of full-time work. Yes. And I, I also think it's a stamp in time that really uh, is a time to look at uh, depending on when, how old you are when you retire and your, the longevity, the demographics. So, you know, if you retire and you're like my father retired, he was 83. Um, so his sort of, his retirement was a sort of shorter period, but if you're 50 and you may live another 50 years, how do you plan for that? And there's, so there's a lot of components that you got to think about. Um, you know, financial planning is huge um, for those that are now going to actually draw from their savings versus income, um, an income stream that keeps them keeps them going and uh you know the cost there uh, it's also time to really look at the cost of things um if you are actually going to live to be a hundred uh the cost of uh living and life-term care and all that all those things um it, it, it i think is a i think it's a big step retirement yeah. yeah no kidding and and speaking of retirement so how how does lasting matters and the work you're doing um, impact women and their families as they're planning for this transition into retirement? However, however they define it or however that looks for them. Well, like I said, um, you know, women, women uh, statistically live longer than men by an average of about six or eight years. So they're more apt to um, outlive their spouse. Um, and so I look at it as really important to take the time to actually, you know, get, get their um, affairs in order or, you know, get, get the information that they need from their spouse to, um, because it could be, it's overwhelming. It's not something that you can do in a day or whatever. It's, it, it takes time to sort of get everything together. But I think especially if finances um, have been delegated to your spouse, um, that it's really important to uh, be educated, be informed about what it is, um, what it is that is happening when your spouse, you know, retires, etc. Is there a succession plan for a business if there's a family business? There's all, you know, there's all kinds of things. So I think that uh, women also are notoriously the the caregivers. They're the they're the they're the ones taking care of, you know, maybe even grandchildren, um, or uh, maybe they still have, you know, people at home. But also they're more the caregivers uh, for family, elder, older family members, parents. Um, so what, what impact does that have on you? Um, when you're, you know, you, maybe you stop working your nine to five job and you retire, but now you're, you know, not, now your job is more like, uh, caring for an elderly uh, parent. It's, there's a lot, there's a lot that of that. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I agree. I, I see all the time, whether it's preparing, preparing for a longer lifespan, uh, maybe, uh, maybe having to account for the fact you were maybe out of the workforce to have and raise children, um, caring for aging parents, or I find more women these days are also uh, have adult children uh, back home oftentimes for a period of time. So it's a lot to juggle. And I think it's important to not lose sight of the fact that you need to make sure you're taking care of yourself and not, not jeopardizing your own situation, even though you love and want to care for these other people in your life. Oh yeah. Self-care is, is probably the number one, yeah. one, number one. It should be number one. Yeah. Easier because said, easier said than done sometimes though. Absolutely. So hard to make that, uh, 
always a priority, but uh, so I, th I think there's a lot of impact on, on women when they, and also the other thing is, you know, if your husband retires and he's been out of the house uh, at an office, et cetera, then you have just, you have another adjustment um, of having somebody home all the time. Right. With saying, well, what are we doing today? <laughs> a lot of people have gotten a taste of that here the last uh, 18 months or so. Yeah. And the, like you said, you talked about adults living home. I, you know, their, I being one, uh, have a, our daughter, our youngest graduated from um, college 2020 virtually um, and has been home for a year. Luckily, um, newly employed with her dream job and going to be moving out, but never intended to be here for that long. So a lot of, yeah, a lot of adult, young adult uh, kids, um, I shouldn't say kids, but uh, a lot of them had to leave sort of the independent lives they were living a couple of years out of college because they could no longer afford, um, you know, the lost jobs, et cetera, could no, no longer afford to live on their own. So there's been a lot, this pandemic has pointed out a lot of things um, that none of us could have, uh, could have ever guessed. But now we know. <laughs> we, we do. It's, it's definitely shaking things up. It'll be interesting to see, you know, what, what transpires over the coming weeks, months, and, and years as we kind of hopefully move back to more of a sense of normalcy, but I, I don't know that, uh, w what is normal, right? <laughs> um, yeah. So as we, uh, as we start to wrap up our conversation today, Barb, um, I don't know if you ever find yourself with an hour or two all to yourself, because I'm sure you're busy um, with lasting matters and family and things like that, but what do you, how do you most enjoy spending spending your time when you've got a little time to yourself? Uh, well, in a nutshell, I both love to read and I love exercising. So I would take that hour or two and I would go outside, put my earbuds in and listen to most likely a book that would otherwise put me to sleep at night. Um, something a little more challenging maybe to read. Uh, and I will, I'll walk, I'll yeah. walk for an hour or two and um, enjoy the being outside and also getting, getting to, getting to listen to some great books. What's the, uh, what's, what's, what's a, what's an interesting book that you've read or, or listened to recently that, that you might recommend that folks check well, out? I loved uh, Hamilton. Yeah. I thought it was great. Um, learn more about history, et cetera, that I hadn't um, in the past. Um, I'm currently listening to Obama's book, which is also, it's great. It's, and it's also kind of fun to hear his voice. So, um, you know, yeah. a variety of things. Yeah, that's great. Um, so if there were, we've covered a lot. Um, and thank you again for, for joining us on, on the conversation today, Barb, if there were one thing that our listeners could take away from our conversation today, what would you want that one thing to be? So um, when I launched Lasting Matters, I came up with this saying, and it's a little crass, but um, uh, it's what's in your head is gone when you're dead. And it really refers to the fact that when you're no longer here, nobody else can ask you the questions and get the answers they need um, that's in your head that only you know that only you know and only you can communicate. Um, and with that, I would always say too that it always seems too early until it's too late. And so to make a plan and take time today, now, to start to get your affairs in order or start to get information down. Uh, you, any, anything that you can offer um, will help um, a, somebody that you care about uh, when it matters the most. Yeah, those are, those are great takeaways. So thanks for that. Before, uh, before I ask you to let people know how they can get in touch with you or learn more about Lasting Matters, is there, is there anything I haven't asked you today that you would like to address or that maybe you wished I'd asked you? 
Well, no, I, I, you know, it's been a great conversation and um, I, I hope that, um, I hope your audience will consider checking out um, Lasting Matters and uh, understand the importance of having these meaningful conversations and making a plan. Well, and with that in mind, what, what's the best way, Barb, for them to uh, learn more about Lasting Matters, to maybe reach out to you if they're interested in, in discussing or learning more about the work you're doing and, and how Lasting Matters might be able to help, help them? Sure. Um, well, the website is uh, lastingmatters.com. Uh, Lasting Matters is one word. Um, my email is barb at lastingmatters.com. My cell phone, if you want to have a chat, 603-490-8305. Um, I am in the midst of refurbishing my website. Uh, the website is up, uh, but I, I have recently um, created an online application uh, for professional advisors. Um, so that component will be in addition to um, the book. Um, and so that's a tool that I created for advisors uh, and, and their uh, multi-generational clients as a, a value-added tool. So I'm hoping to get that launched um, within the month or so. Great. Well, I, I know I know among uh, among individuals and families, I know I, I, we have some advisors that, that listen to the show. So if you're an advisor or uh, just someone that's uh, interested in learning more about how Lasting Matters might be able to help you um, and your loved ones, uh, be sure to go to lastingmatters.com, reach out to Barb, uh, learn more. Um, she's always been a wonderful and generous resource uh, in the time I've known her. And I know, I know she'd, she'd love to, to help you out. So um, Barb, as we wrap up, anything else you'd like to add? No, just stay well. Yeah, well, you, you too. And thanks, thanks so much for joining us today. I, re I really enjoyed the, the conversation and, and catching up with you. Thanks, Ross. I, I, it was great. Great yeah, to catch up. Yeah, likewise. And, and thanks, everyone, for listening to uh, this episode of uh, Women's Retirement Radio. And we will look forward to catching up with you again next time. Hey, before you go, it's Russ again with some important disclosure information for you. You should consult a financial advisor familiar with the specific circumstances of your unique financial situation before making any financial decisions. Nothing in this broadcast constitutes a solicitation for the sale or purchase of any securities. Any mentioned rates of return are historical or hypothetical in nature and are not a guarantee of future returns. I'm a financial advisor, a certified divorce financial analyst, and an investment advisor representative of Wealthcare Capital Management, LLC, an SEC-registered investment advisor based in Richmond, Virginia. The views discussed in this podcast are my own and may not be consistent with or re represent those of Wealthcare Capital Management.